Approval of the agenda. President, I recommend that we approve the agenda. Um, approve is presented with the following amendments additional classified personnel actions for consideration, item C3. And number two, add item G1 wig spotlight for Victor Analysis Elementary School. Is there a second? Sorry. Is there any discussion? One favor say aye. Aye. Do we have any delegation Q and A or public comment? So we will start with the building presentation from Gertrude Walker Elementary School. Okay. You're back. I'm back. <laughs> I was going to say, of course, I'm fortunate to have the opportunity again. I think the first time I was here, we did the wig spotlight. Now I get a spotlight our whole school. So we're going to start off. By linking to the Apple TV. <laughs> okay, I have uh, several representatives of our school here. You can come on up. Come on. So, first. I want you to introduce yourself. Okay. These are all fourth graders, part of our Stuco, and they're going to start off with our waves chant that we do each morning. So at Gertrude Walker, home at the Dol home of the Dolphins, we like to make waves. Waves is an acronym for our expectations, which we'll I'll talk to you a little about here in a minute. But they're going to get started. They're going to introduce yourselves, and then they'll do our chant. Go ahead. My name is Valerie. My name is Kimberly. My name is Adea. My name is Jorge. My name is Raul. My name is Courtney. W. Wise decisions. Making good choices all day. A. Ambitious. Don't be afraid to take risks. B. Value self and others. We are in Dolphin family and we treat others the way we want to be treated. E. Encourage. We can do it. Si se puede. S. S. Self-reliance. So we can do things on our own. Let's, Let's make, make waves. waves. Let's make, make waves. waves. We are proud to be dolphins. So, Gertrude Walker, home of the Midwest Dolphins. So why were the dolphins? It, we were built in 1975, and that's what they decided as a mascot. And here's Gertie, our dolphin. And so in 1975, for those of you that don't know, our building was dedicated to Gertrude Walker. She taught here for 34 years was in, uh, in education. Here, and that's this is who our building was named after. And if you come to Gertrude Walker, there's a little display of the history of Gertrude Walker, and she's there, as many of the other buildings. This is our student population. I'll zoom in. Kind of hard to see. So we currently have 211 students. We have two sections of each, K through four. And we're at 85% free and reduced. We have 10 different languages represented. Spanish, Arabic, Burmese, Creole, Quiche, Somali, some I can't pronounce. And there's our group right there represented. And I'm, I'm gonna introduce you to our staff, I kind of just want to give you a window into Gertrude Walker before we look at discipline and academic data. But none of that could be possible without our staff. And we have Kinder, classrooms represented are Ms. Garcia and Ms. Schaffners. First grade, we have Mrs. Johnson and Ms. Stevens. 
Second grade, we have Miss Shiloh and Miss Mosier. Third grade, we have Mrs. Diver, Mrs. Copper, and Miss Stevenson. Fourth grade, we have Mr. Brager and Mr. Teeter. And then our special education group. I'm getting new to Prezi too. I don't know why it does that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to make you dizzy. We have Miss Bender, Miss Lamb, Miss Ketterling, and Mr. Moya. And our specials for library, we have Miss Thornburg, Dr. Bright for music, Mrs. Rivas, science, Miss Perez, art, and Mr. Lynch, PE. And then our instructional coach, Ms. Madera, and our paraeducators. I got to stop Zooming, I guess. We'll go back. And I will say our paraeducator group, along with our teacher group, is one of the most dedicated I feel that I have ever worked with. They always go above and beyond and really need to be recognized. They're, they're just always there doing their job and above and beyond what we ask them to do. And I know all our teachers really appreciate them. So I wanted to include a couple things that we've done in Gertrude Walker in terms of community service. So we have the after school program with Mrs. Schwer, and she got her after school group at Gertrude Walker and they brought in donations for the Emmaus house. And she actually brought in a bus, had them loaded up, and had them take it over to the Emmaus house to make that donation. It was a really, really good experience for our after school group. <laughs> and then over here, try not to spin it around. We have the Red Kettle Challenge. So in our school district, the elementary group has been doing the Red Kettle Challenge for a long time. And whoever raises the most money wins a pizza party. And this year, Gertrude Walker raised the most money. And I was just, I was really, really proud of them. And every day you could see students with bags and bags of change, finding it and just bringing it. And I think, I mean, a lot of our families, some of them may benefit from those services, but they, they came and brought the most money and we were able to win that pizza party. So we're really proud of them. And you can see our, there's our student council group. A lot of them sitting over right there that helped lead that. And we're at, at the front ringing the bell every morning. And then here's a couple of our family engagement nights. Again with, there we go again. Let's try this. With Mrs. Schwer in the after school program, we did an engagement night together where we brought in academics and we brought in, brought in STEM, STEM projects. In the cafeteria, you can see some games there. Teachers did some reading activities, some math activities that they could send, send home. And then you see Ms. Stivert over here doing a STEM project for students. I think we had about 240, 250 in attendance. And then over here is our family meal during the holidays where the schools do a Thanksgiving meal and you can sign up to do that. And I, I think that's, let's zoom in a little bit. There he is. There's Mr. Johnson serving food over there, helping us. He just happened to be there, jumped right in and started serving for us. I do have it. Don't eat for a haircut. <laughs> and some of the family. So that, that was a really, really good night or day. And then um, we've tried to do a lot of fun while we're learning to help build culture. And so I grabbed just a few photos and I'll go through them a little bit, describe what's going on. So we had a, one of our spirit weeks and it was a dress like day. So someone, I don't know who, thought it'd be a good idea to dress like me. <laughs> so there we are. Having a good time. And so the coffee mug I usually use, there's like 12 of them in the lounge. So they were able to grab those too. And I'm walking around with that a lot if you see me. 
And here we are involved in a parade. And you can't see them, but the, there's our Gertie right there. There you can see them and our students. Okay. Here, which we need to do more of, we just tried to do some surprise and delights for our teachers. Over to the left, you see a drink cart that we try to do once or twice a month and just bring around to give the teachers beverages. And there we're doing some breakfast for our staff. This is me introducing the wigs for the first time, which we'll look at here in just a second. This is, we did a staff appreciation week where we were really trying to take care of ourselves and just lighten up. And each week they had a card that they needed to fill out. And on this particular day, one of them was a goofy selfie. And so there's a couple pictures of that goofy selfie that we did throughout the week. And then here, is our cheer line for our state assessments. And the third and fourth graders loved it so much. The first day we did it each day for our state assessments to get them pumped up. And our kindergarten through second grade made posters for them and words of aff affirmation that they put on the lockers. So here's what we saw our student council present. So at Gertrude Walker, we have waves and as part of our PBIS positive behavior school-wide system where we have expectations throughout the building for our students to follow. And this is an example of, if I can zoom in a little bit more. So in each area of the school hallway, restroom, classroom, this is what wise decisions looks like, which is what they gave an example of being ambitious looks like. And then we have our hallway, we have our restroom, we have our classroom. And then what that looks like in each one and then those are posted around the school. And the reason I, I kind of go over that in the culture and the fun and the learning. And our teachers and our pairs and all the staff is how we can improve discipline and academic data. And so that's what I'm gonna show you next. And I really, really feel like we're on the right trajectory. And a lot of that has to do with what we see here. So on our discipline data incidents last year, we went from major 155 to 38, minor 305 to 280, and then positive 13 to 167. And I know, I think it was brought up at, I think I was here at one of the board meetings where there were some questions on positive referrals. And so if you have questions on that, let me know. But so the positive referrals are really for students that are doing what they're supposed to do. They're following those waves expectations. And it's really important to recognize those. We do still have some work to do in that minor area, but we're headed in the right direction. And then for our academic data, we have our wigs, which I was able to present to you last time. So we we're looking at growth goals for fast bridge testing. And we talked about fast bridge testing and all the different components and that students will be authentically engaged in reading, writing and speaking, listening, using the walkthrough tool. So currently we're at about 80% of all students authentically engaged. This means they are in text. They're at grade level, they're talking about those texts, they're having conversations about those texts, they're answering questions with each other, they're writing just statements or main ideas, and they're really involved in that learning. And then the other part I have is our growth goal. And we are, right now, we just got done with state assessments, and I'm really excited to see those. We don't have those results yet. And here we still see the, the, fall to winter. We're just now doing spring fast bridge, which I'm really excited to see those results as well. So what you see here, I'm going to kind of focus in on the typical and aggressive growth. So we have flat growth, modest growth, typical growth, and aggressive growth. What I like to see is more in the typical and the aggressive growth. If, we're, if our percentage is higher in the typical and aggressive, we're moving our kids more. 
And typically our kids come in a little behind. And so if we can get that aggressive growth up, we're gonna move them quicker. So if you look at from 2021, 20, 22 to 2022, 20, 23, kindergarten's aggressive growth in ELA went from five to 40%. First grade went from eight to 18%. Second grade went from 25 to 51%. And third grade went from 19 to 29%. And fourth grade went from 13% to 26%. This was from fall to winter. And then we'll put in the spring. And then math is the, has the same types of things, kindergarten 13 to 31, first grade 27 to 25, second grade 23 to 42, third grade nine to 33, and fourth grade 12 to 29. So it's, to me, this, the typical growth, the growth report is really showing that we're moving towards our growth goal and we're headed in the right direction. And I'm really excited to see what that spring data tells us. And that's Gertrude Walker. I think I got it in seven minutes, less. Do you have any questions for me? I appreciate your presentation. And um, even on your uh, minor behaviors, you know, can't change things overnight. And I appreciate that just, just um, honest data that, you know, we're making good changes, but it's not going to change overnight. But there were some significant changes in some of the areas. So that's awesome because I know that was something that teachers were really struggling with and probably still are, but, <laughs> but it sounds like you're moving in a really good direction. So that's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks for coming, students. We didn't have you come shake our hand. Do you guys want to? Get a bit? Thank you. 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 Madam President, I recommend we approve the consent agenda with uh, the following. Go get a pen, sir. All right. Well, no, good job, buddy. Thank you. 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 Thank any discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same. Okay. okay, we will move on to the board's goal update with the individual plan of study. Yeah, <laughs> 
Okay. I'm Mary Kaim and I'm the counselor at Horace Good Middle School. I'm Kelly Pitts, I'm counselor at Kenneth Henderson Middle School. And today we're going to talk about the individual plan of study at the middle schools. So intro to Zello and counselors and teachers we meet with students throughout the year to work on their IPS, their individual plan of study. Both classroom and mentoring time is utilized. Staff are trained um, on Zello and provided access to the Zello program. Um, counselors, we've developed the criteria, criteria for the IPS individual plan of studies for seventh and eighth graders. And during middle school year, purpose is really just to explore careers. And we start when seventh grade, we have students complete the learning styles um, inventory where they understand their learning style and teaches them techniques that they can use to help themselves learn using that style. And then they also take the matchmaker, which bases, um, they match, the, which is an assessment they take about their interests and it matches them with careers based on their interests. And so they explore those careers and then they save the top three that they're most interested in or more if they choose. And then, um, we every other year we have a career fair and this year next, last year we had a career fair and i know at kh and i believe at Horsgood mm -hmm. too they were successful we had a lot of speakers come and share their careers with our students and we had a lot of good feedback from the speakers and from the students and then every year in seventh grade eighth grade and continuing to high school students complete um, cello lessons which are career exploration lessons in seventh grade we have students complete the learning styles lesson discover a uh, learning pathways, biases and career choices and defining success. And then in eighth grade students take the personality styles um, inventory and then they also com complete mission complete. And both in seventh and eighth grade, um, sorry, in seventh grade, we just explain what an IPS, the individual plan of study is to students. And we, and we show them how Zello meets the requirements for their IPS. And then in eighth grade, we review that information with students. And then um, they, the lessons they complete in eighth grade are the skills lesson, explore career matches, transition to high school, and self-advocacy. And like Kelly said about the career fair counselors, we look at the top um, Zello career choices, and we invite those individuals with those careers to present at our schools. And students get to choose three speakers, and the career fairs are held every other year. So as far as parent involvement, um, parents were notified about Zello via email. Also, we use the Remind app and we send home a letter with students um, so they have a paper copy of the information. Um, Zello has a parent portal that we email parent access to, and that's where they can review their students' IPS information throughout the school year. And um, we do email them about the, that and they can monitor the IPS. So students during parent-teacher conferences they present their IPS to parents. And if they can't, if parents aren't able to make it in person, then they can do it virtually during mentoring time, either over the phone or over Skype, um, or in the last case resort, they may have to just film the conference at home. But we just make sure, we try do our best to make sure everybody, every student has presented their IPS to their parent. And so data collection at the end of the first semester, counselors monitor the students' IPS progress. And during the second semester, counselors will ensure that 90% of students will complete the, their IPS portfolio. Um, our successes for this school year, 99% of students um, completed their individual plan of studies at Horace Good, 97% at KH. Um, and this was our second year having students present their IPS to their parents. And I feel like it, we had even better, better success yes. this year than last year. Yep. We're over 80%. Yes. 78% so. at Cage. Mm -hmm. So pretty close. Yep. Okay. Any questions? Can, can they change that? You know, if, we, if you put them on a direction for this, mm -hmm. but can that change? Oh, yeah, from year to year, they can change their their choices, and it's easy to do on Zello. They just click a heart to save it, or click a heart to unsave it. And so, yeah. How um, how much do you think students like understand and like really value what they're getting at the middle school level? Because you know, a lot of times they don't see the long term of how these things. I mean, I see that even where I'm at. <laughs> to do those explorations or those kinds of things. What kind of response do you get from student, like middle school students? 
Um, I think as counselors, especially working one on one with students, a lot of the students don't seem to make that connection. So that's our role as a counselor is try to help them connect. What are the benefits of what you're doing now in middle school and how is this going to help you achieve your end goal, you know, and finding that career that you're going to enjoy someday. And um, I don't think it comes naturally to middle schoolers to do that on their own. So hopefully these Della lessons are helping all the students really kind of start thinking about why what I'm doing now really matters and how it's going to help me in the future. <laughs> so. But it doesn't seem like something that comes naturally. <laughs> Thank you. I just I think it's great that we're you're doing this at the middle school level. I think once the students get to high school, they have opportunities to start taking college classes. And if they're already thinking in a specific because they you know have this brought to them in seventh and eighth grade, I think it just sets them down that path so much sooner and, and helps them kind of get ready for what's what's after high school. So thanks for having <laughs> Good evening. I'm Christina Yonkman. I'm the counselor at the Garden City Achieve. And so I'm going to share information. Um, you're going to hear a little bit of repeat, but I won't go into some detail if they've shared it. Um, our students do work on their individual plan of study during our mentoring time, which is a 48-minute block. Um, myself, I help with them, but also our mentoring teachers have a huge role in that because um, of the number of kids, you know, that we can't meet individually one-on-one -on -one all the time with them. So we um, monitor their progress and we provide assistance as they go through it. Um, in our building, Zello is just one piece of the IPS. Um, we do use it as our online portal. And like they explained everything, um, they start at the middle school and then they use it once they get into high school. Um, this is just kind of a timeline. We start in September and go through conference time. And each month we try to have a specific thing um, that they do during mentoring. Our mentoring time is jam-packed with activities and things. So mentor, um, this Zello and IPS is just one part of that. But you can see here, they start with the personality style. They do their mission, the learning styles, their goals and plans. And then just last year, we started with the lessons. Um, we met with the high school and our Zello um, coordinator is what I called him. I don't know what he was. He was our guide. <laughs> and we kind of decided what lessons we wanted to use at each level. And so we've incorporated that. And each year we reset this so that, okay, so if they took it as a freshman, well, they took it to middle school, but then they take it with us as a freshman, then the next year they'll reset it. Because like you said, their um, interest may change. And so then they will see what, you know, as it changes as they go through each year. And then in February, they can personalize their plan. They can add pictures. They can add things like their, um, uh, if they volunteer places, they can add in their work, um, their interest. And then in February, during parent-teacher conference time, we also do the parent IPS conference with them. So that's just kind of our Zello timeline. We have, I'm not sure why that's not showing up there. It says Career Connections up at the top there. We have a class called Career Connections, and our students can, um, or I'm sorry, not a class. It's a mentoring activity that our students can sign up for, 9th through 12th graders, and we invite local businesses. And we try really hard to find a local graduate to come in with that business because it kind of helps our kids really see, oh, my gosh, they graduated from Garden City, and they can actually have a job doing this. And so this is a list of places that we've invited in this year. We had a variety and we tried to look at our Zello results, but we also, um, sometimes the kids will just say, hey, I'm really interested, like the Army, it just kind of came up. We had somebody really interested, so we reached out to them. And so we had a variety of places there come and um, visit with us this year. The kids really enjoy it because it's kind of a question and answer. The businesses get to visit with them. And then I'm amazed, but our kids, they like, just have a conversation with them and they ask lots of questions. So that's one piece of it. And then we also have two classes above JAG. It actually says career exploration. So we have two classes that work specifically with careers. And that's our um, career exploration and our JAG classes. This is where they get an opportunity to explore careers. Um, JAG works specifically on post-secondary, so either work or um, college. And then our career connections class, they actually get to go out and either um, like you, they get to do workplace um, experience where they actually have a job and so they're getting credit to leave and get that work or they can just do some job shadowing if they're not sure what they want or if they just don't have a job. So those are two things that we 
also work in with our IPS. And then we're really excited this year at um, Garden City Achieve, we're incorporating the Leader in Me curriculum and the program. And so this is going to be another whole concept that we can add into their IPS. Um, this year, they started working on the seven habits during mentoring. And then next year, we're going to experiment. We don't know because we've never done it before, but we're gonna try, they, the Leader in Me has a um, virtual and online portfolio. So we're gonna try to incorporate that with our Zello and kind of see what we like. And um, we're, we're really hoping that maybe the leader in me is a, a little bit more um, broad for them that they can add a lot of things into. And then um, as far as their graduation plan and college and career readiness, um, I do meet with every student twice a year, once in the fall and once in the spring. And so we go over their credits, we go over what their plans are, and then we had a new opportunity this year. TRIO from Dodge City Community College approached us. They had grant money. And so they've worked with our students this year and they've got to do things like they went to the Air Museum and Liberal. They went and toured Fort Hay State. We got to tour Dodge City Community College. So that's been an opportunity for our kids. And then as you can see, we've had lots of college admission reps. Um, we've gone on a couple tours where we took a bus load. We've attended the college planning conference at the high school. Um, exploration day at the college. And then we, of course, have our financial aid nights and our workshops um, in our building where I manage those. So there's lots of activities that the kids um, college bound or just wanting to see what their um, interests are can participate in. As far as parent involvement, um, the parents were notified about Zello through Remind and emails. And we also invited each one of them to join their students portal so they can see what the students are doing. Um, we also had students present to their parents at conferences, and um, some of that was in person. We also had some do it on the phone. I had a teacher one night at six o'clock call and said, hey, add another one because they just called and we just did it. Um, it was kind of a spur of the moment. So the important thing is that the, the parents are being notified about it. Um, I also meet with all of our graduates and their parents, and we talk about their post plans and their credits so that the parents know what to expect with graduation. And then this year we had a um, community fair. And so all of our families were invited to that. And there were some career opportunities there as well as informational booths. And then this year, the added was the leader in me survey. Parents um, took, had an opportunity to take that survey. So as far as our successes this year, our goal was to have every student complete an IPS and present to their parents. Um, like I said, some of that was in person, some was through Zoom or telephone. We actually had, when I went to look at the data, we had 99% complete the IPS, and I'm still on that one student. <laughs> we didn't think he was gonna finish. He kind of quit coming, he's an 18 year old, but he is coming back now. We're working on his credits, and I'm determined for him to finish his Zello before he leaves. 77% um, of ours presented at the conferences, which was a little lower than what we were hoping for, but um, we were just excited that that many parents um, were willing to do the individual conference. And then I'm really excited and really proud that 100% of our graduates with their parents met with me. Now, a few of those were over the phone, but that way there aren't any surprises when it comes to graduation. So that's kind of a synopsis of the Achieve. <laughs> you guys have any questions? Well, that 100% of parent contact for graduates is amazing. So mm -hmm. congratulations to you. That's well, not easy. <laughs> And I do have to give, you know, we have to have translators for a lot. So there's a lot of organization that goes into that, but I feel like it's really important, especially with our students where their parents just aren't real sure when and if they're going to graduate. So that's something I really, most of my fall is working on that. Okay. I get on secretly <laughs> watch what that machine. Well, no, I was too. I was just pushing the air on That's what I'm about. Okay. That's why I kept sneaking. <laughs> Yep, I'll start by introducing myself. This is my first time to do this, so it's I'm a work in progress. I've been with the district since 2015, but at the intermediate level, and this has been my first year as a career counselor, and I've really enjoyed it. So I brought along a wealth knowledge here, and she's been my go-to and I'm hoping to show you that with IPS, there's a lot to it. It's very vast. And so I'd like to start um, 
In the beginning year of our senior night, I um, did present these books and then we have them available for seniors. And I have some of you like to look at it, but kind of just get an idea, where do you see yourself going in life? Do you see yourself enrolling in employment or enlisting? And I feel like part of my role is just making sure kids know there's a place for you. And that time can change down the road. You never know what life can bring. And it's important to have that flexibility for sure. So if I go on, um, I had a lot to learn and there's a lot to it that I didn't realize. Um, I even have adult children. And so I just put on there and it's kind of cut off, but you know, what Kansas really looks at in the IPS, all the different parts and kind of what you um, said earlier, Zillow is just a part of, it just supports. Um, it what is cut <laughs> off is there is some pretty cool things coming up with Zillow. They know they have Kansas in a well place, so they're going to treat Kansas right. Um, they're making sure we're keeping compliant with everything that we need to. There's changes constantly coming up with IPS. Um, one thing that I'm excited about that um, kind of touched on it a little bit is the portfolio option. Um, there is ways that our students are doing that now, but they have, and I've experimented, you can be a student um, example, and I've been playing with it now. So that's going to be already built in. There's also a lot of advancement coming in for like college planning. Um, you can check where your FAFSA is, and you can check with colleges um, about where your application process is. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting more into what Zilla has, the capabilities of that. Um, so, gosh, it got cut off. <laughs> but anyway, so I went to the Connect Dots um, conference um, with Jenny Hands, and it was just people from Kansas. I got to hear what, you know, we're looking at, um, what we want our kids to see. And so I, this lady had this drawn out, and I thought it was brilliant. And so the individual plan of study is an all-encompassing process that includes the following under its umbrella. And really, there's a lot more to it. You know, we have the career and college prep. We have the, you know, social emotional, which are kind of turning to employability skills. I'm excited about that. Um, career and technical education, CTE. You're going to hear a little bit about that tonight. Academic planning. I can't stress this enough that I'm, I'm incredibly impressed how much effort the counselors put into that. Um, when you look at in all the state of Kansas, our percentage is way up there of getting kids the opportunity to be successful upon graduating. So I can't take credit for that, but I know that person can. She does a lot of work. Um, we have the work learning experiences and then the career and technical student organization. So there's a lot to IPS. Um, this I took from the state of Kansas. And so you're looking at all the circles we have incorporated into a student. And so there's a lot to be in compliant with that within this, the Kansas expectations. So before I kind of jump into Zillow particularly, I think it's important to kind of see um, what we do. Um, I'm part of some of these, but not all of them. So this is IPS at a glance. And some of the awards, as you see, you know, we get, were recognized as all stars. Um, then we received the bronze star um, level from the state of Kansas. And so these are like people that are looking at it, giving this credit, credit to us. Um, it's cut off by half ninth grade, just to give you a little bit of what we've done. Like ninth grade, there's future finance. Um, now we have the quick career exploration. We have a big career fair for ninth graders, bring communities in. Um, and that's more Ginny does that. But we have the Zillow lessons um, and we have academic advising that is starting. 10th grade, there, these are just a few things. Um, they start dual credit opportunities. Um, we, had, we had about 35 kids, I'm hoping to grow that, that took the PSAT um, this year. We have, they're able to take AP classes. Um, and going on, again, they're doing the Zillow um, and then academic lettering, college rep visits, and academic counseling advising. That's when they start getting really involved. So 11th grade, you can tell us next column, there's a lot going on there. 
Um, as you can see, Exploration Day, we were able to do that. We have a, we host the college career play, the CPC, which is a big deal. Community, I mean, local small towns come in, um, didn't realize how big that was until I was part of it. Um, but I feel like it was a, a success. We have heard a lot of good comments from colleges. Um, then seniors. And I did get to meet, I, I wrote down the number, which was kind of cool with, we had, and the number may, may have been changed, but 122 early grads. And what really appealed to me about taking this job was I met with my counselor, not knowing what do I do with life. And there wasn't internet, there wasn't all that thing, all that back then, um, but she was kind of able to give me some guidance. And so I really got to meet with 122 early grads this year and kind of hearing what, what they're thinking in life. It was a lot of fun. So anyway, that's the opportunities we have for the seniors. Um, communication. We, and I like the Remind app, I don't do that, I will. Um, with Wazilla, there is an email that goes out. I don't know if how it, um, where it goes to, if it goes into people's clutter or what, but I wanted to show you, we have several different ways um, that we do communicate with parents. Um, we have, I put that image in the middle because I feel like that's where our world is today. We can be right by somebody and texting them looking away. And so it is tricky to get everyone on this page. But we do, when we have upcoming events, we do the morning announcements, um, put it on the website, we send it out on email. Um, monthly, we do have a newsletter. And at the bottom is resources that there's an app that has all the upcoming college visits that they can scan and see who's coming. Um, we also have all the scholarship opportunities there. And that, that a newsletter was just an example of October we had going on. So looking at Zillow, um, I didn't break it down. Um, in October, I think we had four different mentoring times um, that I worked with the principal. And so we had them revisit their personality styles. They had them revisit their learning styles. They don't have to, it doesn't have to be reset, but we gave them time to relook to see if there's something they want to change in that. So that was October. Um, and then we started seeing change in our classes with grade levels. Um, so going on. And then in um, really, we started preparing for the IPS. Um, and I can show you. I sent monthly lesson things to teachers. And everything's going to probably drop here. Ooh, thank you. This is example of November. And so our different times that we had, we had five different sessions that we were on Zillow. Um, and then they were, we were starting to work on either if they want to do a PowerPoint or we gave them a worksheet um, that they could present for their IPS. So they were looking through it um, as they were doing their learning style, they could put that information right away where it needed to go. Um, again, lessons were completed during mentoring time. Um, teachers were instructed through an Excel form. And I have to say, I appreciate the administration's support with that because um, they made lessons like um, connected with grades. And that helped with, with quite a bit of accountability with students and I'd say teachers as well. So at the end, um, we did have 80 or 98 percent to utilize um, the, the Zillow lessons and IPS portfolio. Um, there was two percent represent populations. And the one thing that's a little tricky is that Skyward constantly updates, connects, and so you have new students that are constantly pulling up. Um, and then we have students that are in different programs with special education that are that get pulled into it that have their own um, IP and IEP plans. And so there is some kids that are exempt. But I tell you, it's constantly checking, like, who are the new students and finding them? And like, you got to do your Zillow lessons. And so I try not to come off frightening to them because um, it is supposed to be a tool for them to really learn more about life. Um, but 
anyway, that's all I have. I've learned from these people that I can add in a little bit next year. But yeah, well, I just want to reiterate um, we have over 200 teachers. We have about what, 1,800 students at a given time. And so it is with Mindy at the hub of it, trying to, you know, she's had to make lesson plans for the teachers to understand. And we do teacher training with it because they are our deliverable access. Um, we counselors can try, but, you know, Mindy will call in. She called in 122 students so we could meet the December deadline of them graduating. So it's not just like, it's, it's a huge team effort between Mindy, our admin, and then our teachers. And, um, also continuing mentoring lessons when we have a long-term sub situation and again new students coming in and out or um mindy two more kids are going to graduate early now can you call you know if we're working kind of all simultaneously in multiple lanes so i just want to commend her for that because you come from the intermediate center up to a 6a school where we're hopping every day and and for our teachers too and the paras that are in fifth hour because it's it, it's taking to reach that bronze, to reach that 98%, it does take, it takes everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want yeah. to thank her yeah. for that. <laughs> so. Any questions? Good work. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to, um, like, on that. you guys are amazing um, what you do. I mean, I have two kids at the high school. I don't know how you guys do it, but I I am so impressed with all the ways that you try it and reach the students, but also the parents. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, texts or whatever the scholarships do or, you know, however, trying to keep everybody <laughs> in the know when it's like you say, the information might be right there, but students just tend to like look right over it. So I am just really grateful to you guys, just because I know you have so, so, so many students, but just to all of you in general, I know counselors have so many students and so many things on your plates. I The IPS is just one of like many, and yet we saw all of the things that that encompasses. So um, just thank you so much, and thank you for your presentation tonight. Hopefully um, you're winding down, but this is probably like your busiest <laughs> 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 time. Super time. Okay. One o'clock meeting. We have 443 kids to graduate. I found out today we have 21 designated state scholars. It's the highest we've had in years. So it's our Super Bowl mm -hmm. time. We get to have it for a month. We're planning senior awards. So this yeah. is when all the benefits of starting yes. from these yes. things on yes. to us, you know, Definitely. like this is because they're a part yes. of it too. I mean, yeah. it's not. Right. It's not just I we right. I am fortunate that I'm gonna hand a senior his or her diploma, but it starts mm -hmm. like I know that it does. It starts yes. and Mrs. Youngman, we share students. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I mean, you know, like she called me on the phone to let me know that one of my kids because she's always gonna be my kid, but yeah. you're we share her now, like she's her kid too. <laughs> so um, you know, so it starts even before that. So yes. so we appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. On to the curriculum reports with our wig spotlight, Victor and Nola. There we go. Area four, principal of the year, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Elementary principal. <clears throat> <laughs> Can I make sure to introduce yourselves before you speak each time? Yes. Oh, before we speak each time. Each time? Sure. Not each time, but before you speak the first time.
All right. Yep. So I'm Tracy Liker, principal at Victor and Alice. Kelly Gerber, TOSA at Victor and Alice. I'm Vicki Mesa. I teach third grade. Crystal Martinez. I teach second grade. Emily Shrumplin, coach at Victor and Alice. Janice Drucker, instructional coach. Yes, instructional. All right. At Victor and Alice, we had a shift this year. Um, as a leadership team, which is Jana, Emily, Kelly, Heather, and myself, we began looking and collecting data based on individual and um, collaborative walkthroughs. The focus, oh, sorry, I took over, didn't I? Sorry. I took my spot. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to mine and then we'll go back. Okay, go for it. Um, one more slide. Yeah. There you go. Um, so last year and in the years past, we would take our walkthrough information, but we would guess where to go. What did the teachers need to know? Their walkthrough form was different than my walkthrough form. So it was really a guessing game. So through collaboration, we came up with this, I call it the old fashioned spreadsheet. We go through and we mark what we see in the classrooms. Um, it's based on student thinking, cooperative learning strategies, student interaction with text and teacher monitoring. And through the opportunity of working with TNTP coaches, they have challenged us, challenged us. They have taken us out of our comfort level <laughs> and we have become more intentional to look at our building wide trends. <clears throat> So our building-wide WIG is all students will participate in lessons daily that are authentically engaging across all curriculum in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Thank you. So with that, with the intentionality, the shift happened. And when I say that, um, it was a shift in our thinking, in the teacher's thinking, in the way we looked, presented, everything. So Jenna and I do weekly grade level meetings um, and every week was a different topic and they just repeat it every month. So once a month we have strategic planning and once a month we do um, professional development. Um, and so one of those pieces in the authentically engaging is uh, using their grade level text to do a closed reading. Um, Vicki Beza is going to talk to you about the closed reading and how that's impacted our class. So one way that I have shifted my teaching and reading this year um, that goes along with our building wig is that instead of following the day-to-day -day benchmark, benchmark curriculum, our third grade team gathers before each unit is taught and we um, start to strategically plan our lessons. The process includes us choosing text from our reading curriculum that align best with the third grade reading standards. And then we come up with questions, activities, or written responses that students can answer um, that focus on specific details of the text. Along with these questions we plan for, we also write exemplary responses, which help us as teachers navigate our students in the classroom as we are teaching them. That way we have a better knowledge of what we want their responses to be to our questions that we're um, asking them. Something that I have enjoyed about um, not having to teach to the curriculum like we used to is that it gives students really enough time to dive into the text. It allows students to have a better understanding of what they are reading, what the author is trying to teach them, and not only that, but it also helps our students relate more to the text personally. Um, it gives them a lot more time to do that. And something that I enjoy most about teaching a close read is that every time the students read the text, they're reading with a purpose, which I think it's really important to teach our students to read with a purpose. Um, with this shift, I have noticed that regardless of what a student's Reading level is they are all actively engaged. They are all able to follow along and participate and 
guide each other through these questions when they're working with their table groups or their shoulder partners. They, the responses that they're giving us are really, really surprising. Um, all of them are, are enjoying to read, which is ultimately our goal. And then a shift that's happened for us as a leadership team is every week when we meet about our wigs and look at our scoreboard, we look at the data trends. Um, Alex from Good to Great put everything in, um, he, takes our score, he took our scoreboard and put it in um, like a growing data, like it changes with the date. I'm not going to describe that. Collection. collection, data collection, there it is. Um, and so we notice um, the trends every week, we can go back and look and change the dates. And, um, and so with that, this is an example of an action step that we wrote for ourselves. Um, so we take what, you know, what we've noticed and what, what we feel like needs to happen anymore. Or, um, and then we put it into an action step. Um, and then these are our commitments. This is just an example of like commitments we made for the week. Um, we make them. Um, Commitments that we can get done that week. Um, small chunks. Small chunks, yes. Um, and then the next week we collaborate about how it went. Do we meet our goal? Do we need to keep on that action step? And what's the So more shifting. Yes. Mid-year, our cumulative data required additional adjusting from our overall building wig. From close reading to our second wig, which focused on phonics. Ms. Martinez will share her instructional practices based on um, this mid year switch. At Victor Nola's first and second grade piloted a program called, for phonics called Foundations. Foundations is a multi sensory phonics spelling and handwriting program that benefits all students. Foundations provides foundational skills that at risk readers and all students benefit from. Lessons are done daily in about 30 minutes that target critical foundational skills, such as print concepts, letter formation, sound mastery, automaticity, and fluency. Foundations has helped my classroom, helped me in my classroom achieve many of the requirements for testing and professional standards. Some of the ways it has changed my teaching and instruction is by making phonics instruction more effective. We now have a plan and a guide we can use. No one has taught teachers specifically how to teach phonics. Um, and Foundations has taught me those skills that we need to target our at-risk students, but it also serves as a prevention for others. This graph represents the results of leadership walkthroughs after teachers embraced our second wig with a phonics focus. All right, well, uh, cut off a little bit, but um, years ago, we had a consultant named Melissa Hancock, and she always said, if you ain't got data, your data don't matter. And she said it just like that. So, you know, um, go ahead. If you have come to visit VO, you know we have this huge data wall that we look at all the time. Um, that is the forefront of our professional development and individual coaching. Um, this wall is a collection of our fast bridge screeners that we do three times a year, our common assessments, and it, our standard based instruction. Okay, so oh, it, didn't fly in. it didn't fly in. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, okay. Okay. I had really cool effects, but just <laughs> visual. Okay. This is just a, a snip of that wall. Um, so, this is our fourth grade. In the spring, the very top one, the spring when they were third graders, after their spring testing, their core instruction showed that they still needed 1.2 phonics and fluency, which is mid-level first grade phonics. So then in the fall, when they became fourth graders, they were in school for a month, we had the fast bridge in September. Then the core was showing that um, they're at 3.2 phonics and fluency, which is mid-level third grade. Now, after winter testing, um, their core is showing that they need um, vocabulary and comprehension. They're at 4.3, which is a fourth grade level. So they're working on the vocabulary and comprehension. There's just a few kids that are still in that phonics area, but it's not a core. Um, and 
they're 46% on track. Once they hit 50%, the core is going to say on track. So we're really excited for our spring results. Um, the teachers have been working really hard to improve. Um, and the kids, I'm not just the teachers, the kids have been working super hard too. Oops, sorry, Tracy. That's all right. Um, as you can see, Victor now strives to create master teachers of literacy. Any questions? Would it be possible to get your slides? Because you know the information is so tiny, but I'd really like to see your your wall and stuff. That'd be really nice. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Victor, you well, I like data too, so <laughs> come see our wall. Yeah. So thank you for doing the work. And looks like you guys are really doing something new and different in some ways, but or a continuation of something great and just making it better. And thank you all for coming to present to us tonight. And good luck for the end of the <laughs> towards the end of the school year. And I hope that your scores are what you want them to be. When you get that. Looks, sounds like everybody's working hard. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. You both. So we'll do the career and technical education report. Mm -hmm. We'll start the backup plan over here. Yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. just a moment. That's <laughs> just <laughs> You don't need this anymore. So, you know, it's important to update your iPad. <laughs> <laughs> but it was prepared. All right. Good evening. I am Jenny Hans. I'm giving you our CTE update tonight. And I'd like to start off by talking about our Kansas CTE Scholar Program. Um, or ours, it's the state's Kansas CTE Scholar. Um, so, CTE Scholar is, it really is cutting things off this evening. You missed number one. Um, it is a program by uh, the Kansas State Department of Education um, for to honor students who are exceptional CTE students. Um, and when we say exceptional, when I go through the six requirements, you're going to realize how exceptional our CTE scholars truly are. Um, so the first three are not terribly difficult. You've got to be a senior. That's pretty easy to check off. Um, you have to complete three CTE credits, and at least two of them must be um, an advanced level course, so a technical or application level course. Um, and I am going to go through later what that actually means, um, so won't we'll answer that now. Um, and then the CTE GPA must be a 3.5 or higher. So this award truly is trying to honor students who are um, really great in their CTE classrooms. Um, our examples tonight that we're about to share, um, they're great in all of their classes, um, but this award, um, perhaps you, we have a CTE student 
who was really great with the hands-on work but struggling academically, this would still um, be an opportunity for them to receive recognition for the skills that they are learning in high school. Um, that might not be a traditional award that they might receive. Um, so those terribly difficult to get. Here's where it gets hard. Uh, our students who earn Kansas CTE Scholar must have proof of their technical skill attainment. Um, so there are quite a few options. The main one is having an industry recognized credential. Um, for example, the OSHA 10 or first aid CPR or any of those um, certifications, but it has to be one that aligns with the pathway that they have taken courses in. Um, it can also be a letter from an employer saying you have the skills. I've, I have witnessed that you have the skills to come work for me in an entry level position. Um, and that's, there's a few others, but that's the main ones. Um, also, on top of all that, these are not ors, these are ands. And they must verify that they have done a civic engagement project, which is a lengthy description, or have at least 100 hours of community service. It's a significant amount of service to our community. On top of that, they need to complete 80 hours of work-based learning experience. Um, so think about that, 100 hours of community service on top of having a job. Um, and then, of course, have a vision for their future and write an essay about it. Um, so this is not an easy award to apply for. Um, the application process takes a long time. It is difficult. So in this year's senior class, we had 454 seniors. I go through every transcript individually. It'll be fun. Uh, 157 out of the 454 seniors met that those first three um, requirements. Those ones are easy for me to look up and find and, and see on paper. I don't know how much a student has done in community service or if they've received their technical skill attainment or if they're doing a work-based learning experience, but I can see those first three. So 157 met those requirements. I sent them a letter at the beginning of the year outlining what this was and that they um, that it looked like at the end of the first semester they would qualify. Then I sent another letter stating you do qualify. Um, here is how to apply um, and to reach out to me. Um, so 14 out of 157 qualifying students reached out to me, indicated they were interested. Um, I do have to create that CT GPA verification for them. So um, I have a pretty good system of knowing who's interested. Um, and then the application deadline is March 1st. Um, if you can think back, we had a pretty significant event at the high school on March 1st. Um, so I believe that thwarted our applications. Um, a lot of those 14 students had reached out to me, asked for passes during mentoring time to come in and just finished scanning their documents because they didn't have a scanner at home or things like that. Um, and when we canceled school early that day, they didn't have the opportunity to come in during mentoring. And um, many of them needed a ride to get somewhere, uh, needed to ride the bus, or just um, in the chaos of the day, forgot. Um, so I am pleased to announce with that craziness, we did have two students apply, two out of the 14 did come in and complete that application and submitted it on time. And so today I'd like to invite Kathy Bo and Anna Lohmeyer to come forward. Last week, KSDE announced our Kansas CTE scholars, and these are our two from Garden City High School. You'd be willing to just quickly say, you know, what pathway classes you took and what you did to complete the application. Um, personally, my uh, pathway that I was working on um, is in welding. Um, and so I've just been taking a few classes down um, in shop throughout high school. And I've really enjoyed them and learned a lot. And I'm really looking forward to being able to use those skills um, at home with my dad on the farm. 
And while that's not necessarily the career path that I am looking to do, I think that they've given me very valuable life skills and I will definitely use them. Um, for the application, I really just had to go back through and look at different things I've done with things I'm already involved in, like NHS and 4-H um, and working with my dad on the farm. And I think it's really neat that they gave both that and I an opportunity to um, put those on paper. Um, similar to Anna, I uh, had classes in the journalism um, aspect of the CTE scholar and also the medical aspect as well. I believe that it helps me kind of um, figure out what I wanted to do in the future. Um, and because of those two classes and courses that I took, I'm able to decide that I do want to go into nursing and such like that. Um, for my application process, it made me realize how much work I've done throughout high school and really appreciate all the help that I've had to get to where I am. So yeah, I'm very thankful. <laughs> So I'd like to give a moment to honor them if you're going to do shaking hands and all that, and then I'll finish our CTE update. Mm -hmm. You guys want to step up a little bit or flags? Thank you. 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 Thank so I thought tonight I'd give a quick crash course in career and technical education, because um, most of you have not heard from me this year. None of you have heard from me this year on CTE, but most of you have not heard of what it's all about. Um, so career and technical education has, um, you know, various umbrellas. So the largest umbrella is our career fields, Kansas tells us what our career fields are. We have seven of them. Um, and at Garden City High School, we have a pathway, at least one pathway in all seven career fields. Um, I know that you can't read them there so very quickly. They are health, um, design, production, and repair, agriculture, business, family and consumer sciences, public services, and media and technology. So those our seven career fields and all of the careers, um, well, they say all of the careers in Kansas will fit in those seven, um, or the careers that are most in need in Kansas fit in those seven career fields. Underneath that umbrella of career fields, we have career clusters, which are smaller groupings. Um, we have 16 career clusters in Kansas, and at Garden City High School, we offer uh, um, we offer 12 career clusters. And from there, we get to pathways. Pathways are a graduated sequence of courses. So we have the introductory level, and then we have technical and application level courses. Um, so the two students you saw tonight um, had to complete at least two of those three credits in those technical and application level courses. So there had to be some rigor involved. Um, so in Kansas, oh, and we have to be a pathway completer or to have a complete pathway, the minimum requirement is that we offer three full credits in that pathway and that we offer at least two that are above the introductory level. Um, and then, so in Kansas, there are 36 pathways. We at Garden City High School offer 16 of those 36 pathways. Um, often get asked, why don't we have all 36? Number one, we need staff for all 36. Um, and second of all, many of them are very similar. Um, so it just doesn't make sense to um, offer two programs that share so many classes. You'd just be counting. You could count a student here or there, but it's the same 
topics. Um, so they're just slightly, some of them are just slightly different um, for different needs around the state. Um, so that's why we're at our current 16. Um, and then of course you have the individual courses that make up the pathway. Um, introductory level courses are often shared amongst um, related pathways. And then the technical and application level courses get more specific. Um, some technical courses are shared between pathways and none of our application level courses are shared there. As, as the students go, they get more and more focused in their career that they're interested in. Um, to go back, we never force a student to stay in a pathway. Um, we do celebrate our CTE completers. We think that's wonderful. Um, but I'm also a strong proponent that high school is the place where you explore. Um, and it's if you decide your senior year that the pathway you've been in is not the pathway for you, hallelujah, you did not pay for college credit for that. Um, so I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, and it's just part of part of my vision in career and technical education is we are exploring. Um, so when our completer numbers maybe you know they'll never be a hundred percent, but when they're not, we're not looking for that. That's not the goal. Um, so CTE funding is everyone thinks that CT has a lot of money. It is um, funded by the Carl D. Perkins Act, um, which provides federal funds for CTE. Um, I have very specific things that I can spend Perkins funds on. Um, the main thing to understand um, is that I can't spend it on anything consumable, which does not only mean food, but also means things like drill bits um, or aux cords in the video broadcasting area, um, SD cards for the cameras in journalism. Um, so there's quite a few things that CTE requires that Perkins cannot fund. So because of that, we also get our 0.5 weighted funding, um, which then Colleen gives back to me. <laughs> I don't know if I get all of it or not. That's a great question, but I do. Um, yeah, I have my own little spot. I just never knew the answer. Um, but anyway, I get we get that 0.5 weighted funding. So on September 20th, we're counting every kid in every CTE class as many times as they are in a CTE class, and we are reporting to that to the state audited. Um, and so that's how we figure out how much money we have. Um, we currently don't know how much money we're getting next year. Um, Word from the state is that it's the federal level that doesn't know how much money we're getting. So um, they said, just be patient this year. It might be a while. So ready for that. Um, so this year, my focus in CTE really has been on improving processes. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about in just a little bit is how um, coming up next year is our comprehensive local needs assessment. And we cannot spend any Perkins funds on things that are not written in our local comprehensive needs assessment, which is done every four years. So looking ahead, it didn't seem smart to put effort into creating a new course or a new pathway if next year we're going to be deciding that that is not something that um, fits our community's needs anymore. Um, and we'll have updated data to make those decisions. So this year, I really focused on improving some processes um, that we've been using. So number one is um, all of those students in all the classes, which I forgot to say this year, we're teaching 77 CTE classes actively. There's 189 on the books. Um, but each of those students in each of those seats in each of those classes has to have a competency profile on file from the beginning of the semester and another one from the end of the semester. And I then use that data to report on them when they are a senior based on all of the CTE courses that individual student has taken. And when I first started, that was done through paper and filing cabinets. And that first year was terrible. Um, from there, I decided we would not do paper ever again. Um, and we spent a long time putting those onto Google Forms, which was much better. Um, my filing cabinets did not burst at the seams anymore. However, going back and finding, I would go to an end for every senior, 400, 500 seniors. I would look up the senior, look up their transcript, highlight all the CTE courses, um, go into the Google forms for each of those classes, 
find which one they were, add up their totals and report that to the state. It took way too much time. Um, so this past year, um, we have spent, well, two years, we started two years ago. We retyped all of the competency profiles and found a way to use Illuminate for that, which is something we are already using as a district. And now all of our um, competency profile responses are done in Illuminate. When I need to report on a student, I just type them in. It shows me all of the competency profiles they have done with their scores, and I can submit it to the state. So that is one thing that has saved so much time and a big improvement in our processes. Um, I've also uh, spent years figuring out how to make how to track our CTE yeah. concentrator and completer status in Skyward, and have finally figured that out. So I can now run a report instead of looking at every transcript up individually and doing the highlighting. Um, additionally, we have a lot more students in work-based learning courses than we did in the past. And in the past, we only had a work-based learning course for business finance. Um, but there are other work-based learning codes that just had not been created. So we went through the process of creating 13 new CTE course codes. So those are funded courses. And if a student is doing a work-based learning that counts for that pathway and that work-based learning code, we will now receive that 0.5 funding for that student. It's really just a change in enrollment and the paperwork, but that could help leverage some of those funds. Um, and then without being thwarted by March 1st phone calls, I had streamlined the process for Kansas CTE Scholar um, using an online system so that the students could be saving all of their things individually as they work on them, um, and I could monitor their progress. Um, and we were almost there to having quite a few more than usual until March 1st. Some events we've done, um, the counselors mentioned with their IPS conversation, um, our freshman career day is big one. Um, we had four alumni speakers, as always, we look for GCHS graduates who are here in Garden City working in an area that relates to each one of our career academies. Um, and so we had four wonderful alumni speakers talk about how their high school experience prepared them for the job they have now and to give some advice to freshman students. And then we had 52 community partners come and present. So we're just thankful for them um, for that event. It's always, always one of my favorite days. So um, that was good. We also did a partnership planning event with our teachers um, on the in-service day on January 3rd. Um, and we had 34 community partners come meet with our CTE teachers um, and discuss things like opportunities to come in for classroom visits or opportunities for students to go to their facility for a field trip. Um, and we've had quite a few wonderful partnership opportunities come out of that session. So as I look toward next year, I already mentioned the local comprehensive needs assessment. That is, I am um, a co-coordinator alongside Chuck Pfeiffer at the college. Um, that's a voluntold position by the state. Um, it is so much work. Um, so we get information from the Kansas Department of Labor about all of the careers in our region. And then it's our job to disseminate that, look into it, figure out what is correct and incorrect. It's not always correct. Um, and determine what our regional needs are, then we write to that and everyone in the region, our Perkins grants for the next four years must relate to what we said was a need in our community um, on that comprehensive needs assessment. Um, so it's a very important guiding document for our community and career and technical education. Um, so it's definitely um, on every four years when that comes up, which this is only year two, but that is a huge focus for me, is making sure that that data is accurate, that it represents our community, um, and it represents the surrounding areas as well, um, because our goal is to make sure we are preparing students for careers that truly do exist here in our region, and that are a need, and that are high skill and high wage. Another goal in the future is to continue to increase our industry recognized credentials. Um, that is a challenge to say the least. There are, there are a lot of issues I'd love to talk to you about. Um, 
namely just um, finding credentials that the state approves um, that are attainable for a high school student. Some of the ones that are approved at the state are much more difficult than high school level. Um, and I just feel like it hasn't really been evened out yet. And funding is another issue. Um, some of them are $10 per credential and some of them are 150. Um, so that is not equitable amongst all of our students. Um, and then they only count in the pathway that the student is being a completer in. Um, so for example, um, Kathy Vo did not qualify to take the OSHA 10 exam because she was not in manufacturing. Um, so just looking, it just makes it inequitable across the different pathways. Um, so continuing to work with the state, they are continuing to look for appropriate credentials that are at a good price point that are valuable to our community um, and to the jobs that are available. Um, and then one of our new KISA goals is to add three new pathways in the next five years of the KISA cycle. Um, so I've already started talking with Garden City Community College and Lucas Sullivan at GC Achieve um, about what we could possibly do to get our automotive program to switch to the mobile equipment maintenance CTE pathway. Um, as we discussed it, it looks like we might need to get a little creative with that or look at what we need to do, but we've started that discussion um, and we all have little assignments we're doing. We'll get back together and see if that really is a possibility. Um, and then at GCHS, we are weighing the pros and cons of um, looking at um, networking systems, information support and services, or programming and software development. Um, we feel like we have a hole in that area. Um, we offer web and digital communications, which is a lot more about how to build a website. It's a little closer to marketing. Um, and we feel like we need more um, of the systems administrator of um, skills. Um, so those three pathways offer that. Um, and we're just looking at which one might be possible and which one of those would be the best use for us to focus on for next year or not to start next year, but, you know, to work on and that's the end. What questions do you have for me? Thank you. I do feel like I do. You do a great job, and we appreciate what you do. And we'll look forward to seeing what new things that we are able to bring to our community. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the final textbook adoption presentation. So um, this, this is our last one. So this one is high school physical education. Um, started to process the same way that we did with elementary PE and elementary history by surveying staff to see what they felt their needs were. Um, in December, we then formed a committee and I met with committee members in February and they gave me their recommendation in March that we took to curriculum council. Um, I did attach what the Kansas health standards are for you to look at. Um, they are, they do each have standards underneath those skills, but that gives you a general idea of what we teach in health at the high school level. Um, the high school team did select Glencoe Health. It is this updated version of what they currently use. So this will be a nine through 12 curriculum. Um, it some key features of it is that it does have interactive text. So the when the students get onto their digital components, they can take notes, make annotations, highlight features in the text that they think are important. 
Um, the assessments are customizable for the teachers so they can go into the question bank and pick the ones that they want. But they also have the option to type their own questions if they've created their own that they want to put in. Um, some other key features are project-based learning. There are both individual and group projects in each of the modules. Um, there are real-world connections that provide students with information pertaining to their health and allows them to practice their writing skills while relating the curriculum content to their personal lives. Um, there's vocab practice, supporting media like um, electronic videos, and there's a fitness zone that provides students with ideas on how to incorporate fitness into their life. And it also gives the teachers physical activities that they could incorporate in the modules that would go along with what they're learning. So. Um, from the teachers, they felt that the text was easy to read. They liked that the chapters and modules were arranged um, in a logical order, but the um, text does allow them to change that. If, there's, if they want to do circulatory system before the skeletal, they can, the online component lets them switch those modules. So um, there are both Spanish and English versions of the text. Um, the teachers liked the individual and group projects that were available, and they felt that the topics that were taught in this text were very relevant to kids at this age. Um, topics like vaping, um, drugs and alcohol, social, social media, and mental health are all covered within this text. Um, additionally, um, we do not have a district in service day until September 25th. So that means we don't have training available until September 25th when we adopt a new curriculum. So um, there are videos within the teacher platform that support them in how to use the different features. So that at least gives them support until we're able to have a, a day of training. So any questions? Go backwards, but I'm just curious. We've looked at three different um, kind of textbook or curriculum adoptions, and just wanted to kind of understand the process for the PE seems to be very similar. Like you did a survey and then you formed a committee, um, but we didn't do that for the um, history mm -hmm. curriculum, the history and kind of maybe even social studies. Mm -hmm. So, what was the difference in in coming to the conclusion that you did, or? the process that you use for the two of those? When I sent out the survey to the teachers, some of the feedback they gave me is um, they questioned getting a full curriculum with the limited amount of time that they have to teach social studies. So um, I went back to the principals and asked, you know, how much time do you have in your daily schedule for social studies? Are you looking to increase that time? And um, Basically, they don't have room to increase the time. So then we sent back another survey asking, what do you want to do to the principals? To, do you want us to proceed with textbook adoption or do you want to continue to use the resources that you've been using? And the feedback that I got from principals was overwhelmingly they wanted to continue to use the resources they were using. Only one of the nine principals that responded wanted the full curriculum in grades K-1, 2, and 3. So when you jumped from the survey of all staff to mostly surveying the principals, that was because of data from the survey itself or because you, yeah, from, from the teachers. From the teachers. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to, you know, ask yeah. for just make sure we're sure it's definitely different, but I mean, I think, um, you know, from our office, we don't see what the daily schedules are for each building. Um, so, you know, that feedback I felt was valuable to then look further um, additionally, some of the principals who served on the ELA curriculum adoption committee when we adopted Benchmark, you know, did give feedback that we talked about this when we adopted Benchmark because it has modules that address social studies, and we felt like it could support those, those um, learning outcomes for social studies. So, you know, taking all that into consideration, we decided you know, K-1, 2, 3 would be best served with what we were already doing. But fourth grade, since it is a testing year and it's a project-based assessment, 
then we felt like they needed a little bit more than what you could get in a periodical and, and the modules that we have in benchmark. And that came from the surveys too? That well, no, that was just more from our office um, and the principals. The principal survey, we did have more principals that wanted it for grade four for that reason. Um, I think I had four principals who wanted a curriculum for fourth grade. And so Jason and I sat down and talked about it and felt like it's kind of unfair to expect them to come up with a project when we don't have the curricular materials um, for them to teach from. Is there any other questions? Sorry, I kind of deviated yeah, that's okay. from this. But any questions on the PE? No. Um, one other thing just to add, um, I had mentioned that we had written a grant for the elementary PE, and we found out that we were approved for that, um, almost $90,000. So um, each of our K through six buildings will receive $5,000 worth of equipment, in addition to the curriculum that we were proposing. So this grant will be purchasing the three through six grade curriculum, um, $5,000 in equipment, and a in-service day. So for every school, the K through six buildings. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yes. Yeah. How does that process work? How do we know about these grants? Who goes after these grants? Um, you know, when we find out about them, we apply if it's relevant. Um, the Spark representative mentioned it to us when we were meeting with him because we talked about the fact that we wanted equipment, but we really didn't have enough money in the budget for a hundred and some thousand dollars worth of equipment. So uh, he said, well, there is a grant program and he said, it's due today. So we really quick sat down, filled out grant applications and found out about a week ago, two weeks ago, 10 days, yeah. 10 days ago that we were approved. Right. So it was a pretty fast turnaround. There's grants in a lot of different places and it's just kind of, you just research. If you've got a need, you know, you look for what your need is. And we were lucky that he mentioned it that day because um, it was due probably five hours after we met. So, is yeah. that grant going to cover what you needed? Um, yes, we were looking at supply packages that were about $6,000 per building. So, yeah, it covers just about everything. Um, when I met with the grant coordinator last week, she said they were going to customize an equipment package and they're going to select the equipment that will support the most modules within Spark. So um, it's not an exact package that they offer for sale, but they're going to customize it for our buildings. So, yeah, but we were excited about it because it's definitely not something that would have been on the budget. So it's good. there's about 20 grants uh, given uh, to schools across the United States. And we were the second highest awarded uh, school in the United States on that uh, grant from San Diego State University. So there was one other district got a little bit more money than us, and we were at ninety thousand. And then like the other eighteen got like two thousand dollars. So um, this was this big kudos to Heather and the elementary principal or elementary uh, PE teachers that worked on getting that done because that's ninety thousand dollars less that we've got to think about coming up from out of general fund to cover that uh, curriculum that can now. Uh, be used in other places. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to board open discussion. Yeah, as always, great to have a lot of good presentations tonight. Fun to have students in the board room, and especially Anna and Kathy, just getting to uh, recognize. Um, them here in front of the Board of Education in front of everybody. That was awesome. So appreciate that. A lot of good information we got tonight. A lot of information. Starting negotiations tomorrow evening went through training last week. Um, let's end the school. Yeah, I'll touch on Jackie. Uh, we started the uh, training. We're getting negotiations fired up. Um, I think it's going to be good. I think we have a good team, both sides of the table. I think everybody's willing to, to work together, and I think it's going to be good. Um, grants are always great. <laughs> That's for sure. So great there. Good job. And uh, I'm very impressed with everybody and the, everybody's hard work.
Uh, just appreciated the presentations tonight on the individual plans of study and the CTE, as well as uh, Victor Ornelas and, and having the students here tonight. So, just great presentations. Thank you. Uh, but, Madam Vice President, <laughs> can I go next? Uh, uh, there were showcases that they alluded to. So, and individual plans of study for our students, the so 7, 8, 9, 12, and achieve. So, I mean, the students that we have in second grade that are at Victor and Allison or Gertrude Walker and the growth that they're showing, but uh, those students will be, I mean, they're going to live to the 22nd century. They're going to see a lot that happens. So anytime we can get careers in front of them, career showcases in front of the reading and writing that they're going to have to, what are the jobs going to look like? What's Garden City going to look like in 80 years? That's going to be uh, vastly different uh, to a degree. Um, so anytime we can do that, uh, CTE achievements, thank you on that. The Zillow, just uh, the growth. Why do, why do I want to, problems you all want to solve moving forward in my life is uh, really what we're striving for. But once again, the growth that Victor and Alice is showing and Gertrude Walker is showing is amazing. And that'll just keep moving us forward. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank Jackie and Randy. Thank you for taking on negotiations. Um, <clears throat> more extra time um, out of your lives to do that and hopefully that goes well so good luck with that and just also thank you to the rest of my fellow board people i think there's a lot that we um, have to do on a daily basis or a year or whatever and um it's it's a lot of work and it, it's hopefully it's teamwork um that we're all working together to do what's best for our district um I, I'm pretty sure I speak for the rest of my fellow board members when I say we're um, we're at your disposal. So I think all of our email addresses are still on the website. So whenever you have questions or concerns, you know, we are people that you can talk to. I know that there's a chain of command. Follow your chain of command, as always. But um, we are here for our community and for the district. So um, I'm sure you all know that, but I'm just going to put that out there as a um, reader to reiterate that. And again, and just appreciate um, everything that our educators and our staff and um, administrators do. Um, it's pretty incredible. And I know um, spring can be really trying and people are exhausted. I know my children are exhausting me and I only have two. So, um, you know, it's a lot and just you are valued and you are appreciated. Um, thank you for how you do. The next board meeting um, will take place on Monday, May 1st, 2023 at 6 p.m. in the board meeting room at the Educational Support Center. We are adjourned.